All righty, guys and ladies, good morning. I hope uh, all of y'all that are going to be joining us live today are having a good morning, a good Friday morning. Um, I'm very excited today because we are starting our morning off with a uh, SPA Friday. We are going to be joined today by uh, one of our favorite uh, air guests, Mr. Frank Doherty. Of course, remember Mr. Frank wrote an outstanding book, uh, with his time with the 219th flying support for CCC and his time flying Sogmen as his passengers and, excuse me, and his uh, time flying four drum uh, secret photo missions, which is very, very interesting. Um, so please, if you don't have that, jump out there and buy that. And we are also joined by none other than Mr. John Myers. Uh, he is SPAF 1. And we have not had him on before. And as far as I know, this might be his first time speaking uh, publicly uh, about his time with uh, the SPAF unit. So this is going to be a good day. And I think we're going to start off by, in case we've got any new view new viewers, we're going to have uh, Mr. Frank give a little brief bio for, for those of y'all that maybe not have heard him. Please go listen to his past uh, visits with us. I'll have them in the show notes. But uh, and then Mr. Frank will, or Mr. John will give himself a, a little bio and we'll get into CCC and uh, some good stories that I've heard offline that we're going to be covering today. So, Mr. Frank, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us this morning, sir. Well, thank you very much for having us. We really <laughs> appreciate it. Very briefly, um, I got to uh, Vietnam on the 4th of September 1969 and went to work flying for the 18th Aviation Company, flying otters out of Da Nang up and down the coast. And in about three weeks, I was profoundly bored and talked my way out of the unit uh, at, and got reassigned to the 219th up at Pleiku. And I think that the company commander at the, two, at the 18th thought he was punishing me. It was absolutely one of the best things that I ever got to do. Flew for CCS originally, and I did that for about a month and a half, and then went to Contum and flew for CCC. That's where I met John, and uh, John was originally, I asked him, how do you how do you avoid getting shot full of holes? And he said, fly sideways. <laughs> so I, I figured out what the hell he was talking about, and that's what I did. So that's why I'm looking at him today, because he told me to fly sideways. And uh, after uh, after Vietnam, I, I went back to the States, instructed at Rucker, got out. Um, somehow, uh, Western Airlines hired me, and uh, I did that for the rest of my life. So here I am. It's all yours, John. All right. I, I appreciate it. I, I guess uh, I'm going to start out. I was born and raised uh, on, on an Indian reservation, as a matter of fact. Uh, born in an Indian hospital and born to uh, two American Indian parents. And both of my parents were, my mother was uh, Cherokee and, and uh, um, Irish, and my father was uh, Kawia and uh, German. So you get, <laughs> you, get, you get some kind of uh, feisty blood, I guess, in that kind of arrangement. But I, I was basically uh, raised in a very, very small school. My high, high school class was 36 people. And to date, uh, about a third of us are. And uh, so, you know, I, um, I was born in early 1941. I guess of all of the pilots that I flew with in, in Vietnam and on this mission particularly, I was probably at least five years older than all of them. And uh, matter of fact, I'm 83 today. I'm the oldest living member of my tribe right now. And that might explain some of the um, art stuff on, on, on my back wall here where I have my office. Um, but I had uh, initially gone to college in a community college and I, for a couple of years, I maintained a, uh, a very solid uh, 4.0 average in fraternity. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, that was, that was a real academic success, I guess. But uh, when the Army drafted me, I had been, I, I was uh, 
just recently divorced, had two children, and uh, was uh, brought into the Army at the grand old age of 25 at the time. And uh, I was had fully intended on uh, doing my two years very honorably and coming home. Uh, I, I both the, all of my relatives, ma- male relatives, had served in uh, in the services during World War II in Korea. So uh, it was very important that uh, that I do my duty uh, when called upon. I had a first sergeant that uh, basically talked me into going to OCS um, uh, during my uh, uh, AIT training. Uh, As a 25-year-old draftee, of course, I was the natural selection for uh, trainee leader uh, in in both uh, basic and and, uh, AIT. So uh, I was, my AIT was at the time called Airborne AIT because I did want to go to Airborne School uh, right away. And that was uh, at Fort Gordon, Georgia at the time. And uh, when I put in for uh, uh, OCS, they decided, well, you can't go with your AIT class to Airborne because you put in for OCS. Well, I've come to understand that I was just getting BS'd on that point. So I was waiting for my class to come out, and I had uh, applied for infantry, infantry, infantry. It allowed you three choices. And when my orders came down, it was fulfilled artillery. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, you know, the Army and its, and its wisdom. And I was told, well, you can go to airborne school out after you graduate. Well, I didn't know at the time, hadn't figured that part out that uh, my graduation month would be in May. Well, what happens in May? That's when the academies all get out. That's when your uh, your ROTC uh, um, distinguished graduates all get out. So by the time I was able to, as a commissioned officer, to put in for uh, airborne school, uh, all of the slots were taken. There was no way that I was going to get in. My first assignment was at uh, Fort... Um, at Colleen, Texas, Fort Hood, uh, I don't know what their name now. They, the woke general officers gave in to changing all the names. So uh, whatever it's named, it was it was Fort Hood back, back then. And uh, so from there, I said, well, you know, I, they're not going to let me into Airborne Ranger School. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do something special. I'm going to volunteer for flight school. And I volunteered for fixed wing and got it. And uh, there were a lot of people around me that had volunteered for fixed wing and didn't get it. And so that, I I guess that was my um, good luck. um, Irish luck coming through. Yeah. (laughs) So when when I got to Vietnam, I was assigned to the 185th uh, rack. And that was down at Bambi Tuit, and I was flying uh, CCS as well, Frank, uh, when I initially started. I, I don't know whether it was dead as dead down there as, as it was when I first got there, but I was absolutely, totally bored to death. It was a radio relay uh, mission at the time, and the area that we were flying over there in Cambodia uh, was... Uh, pretty doggone flat. There was, there was really no uh, discernible uh, contours to the terrain. And most of the time when I was there, I, I got there in uh, in late January of uh, 69. It was all smoky, so you, you couldn't really see anything on the ground uh, unless you were right over it because they, they, were, they were burning charcoal or something down there all the time. So I heard that there was a lot going on up at CCC, and I volunteered to go up there. And I got up there uh, as Bruce Bruce Besser's uh, replacement. When I got there, it was Rex Hill that was the SPAF-1. And he had just landed his aircraft with half of the the tail end of his bird dog shot off with a 23-millimeter round. It actually hit and exploded. And, um, however, he was, uh, 
at the very end of his tour at the time. Pete Johnson was also there. One and um, because of uh, rank and, and so on and so forth, uh, when uh, Rex Hale left, um, I was made staff one. I don't think Pete was extremely happy about that because I think he envisioned that he would be taking over in that slot. Uh, and, and I came in and, you know, the military being what it is, I, I had the data rank. So, but then Phil showed up and not far behind him. Um, let's see, I think Doug um, Kraut was the next one in there. And then um, Frank came along. Um, you all know the story about Bruce Besser, right? I know Frank does. We Would got, you care to cover that uh, coming from? The only thing I know because it happened after uh, or before I got there. Uh, I came in after he had been been shot down uh, on, on the other side of the fence. Uh, his aircraft or his body has never been recovered to my knowledge. And it, it was really kind of a sad, sad kind of thing. But uh, until that happened, I don't really think there was anybody that um, really understood the inherent dangers out there where we were flying because there was AAA out there. There was reports that they even had 57 millimeter anti-aircraft uh, weapons out there, although I don't think I, they ever fired that at me. Um, but pretty much everything else, um, there was, uh, one time when I was flying a, a night mission, um, with, uh, Pete Johnson and there was a single round, a single exploding round that came in behind my aircraft and it didn't, it didn't leave any shrapnel, but the displacement of air flipped my bird up into a to another attitude and I we turned our lights off at that point <laughs> it was it was really something it, um, you know some of some of the some of the great people that that we served with there are uh, you know are etched in in my memory and and one of those people I, I was taking some criticism because I was uh, it was said that I was taking chances that I didn't have to take. But I I thought, you know, as a former hunter and somebody that had um, hunted birds a lot in my youth, uh, the way I flew over there, uh, uh, Frank uh, mentioned earlier, I think what I said, fly crooked. And what, what, uh, what I meant was don't, do not fly um, coordinated because, you know, a, a smart guy and a good hunter down there on the ground that's got a, a, a comparable weapon can take you right out of the air. And, uh, you know, you, you want to be deceptive about how, how you fly. And one of the, one of the cardinal rules and, and, um, Rex Hill is the one that gave me my hint when I asked him, I said, well, how do I avoid getting my ass shot off like you just did, you did and he says you got to fly crooked and you got to keep the gear in the trees and uh you know you and 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 the cardinal rule is you never retrace your your flight path if you go over point a once is enough and you don't come back over it and uh he said that's how he got shot was doubling back. Y'all, y'all actually lost a, a a a rider, did y'all not, Mister Armstrong? I think you covered in the book. Sadly, I, I, I wanted to make a, a, a deadly second pass. Uh, the no no. They uh, that happened after I left. Oh, uh, that was that was that was one of Phil's passengers. But um, we mentioned uh, Frank Greco a few minutes ago. Um, I think if my memory serves me, <clears throat> Frank, not only was a shutterbug, but he was, he was also cross-trained 
uh, as a uh, as a as an explosive guy. And uh, so we were out there, and he says, "You know, I I really wanted to make a bomb <laughs> to drop over these things." So he had 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 this case of, and it's and it's about a foot long and probably about eight inches wide, and about four inches deep, of uh, of uh, sixteen penny nails. Oh. And what we did was we took the nails out, and we put. Two two pounds of uh, um, C4 of um, C4 in there. C4. That's what I was looking for. Uh, C4 in there, and then repack the rest of the nails <laughs> around it and put put a time fuse on it. So we went through all kinds of calculations of how high I had to fly so that the thing would. We were trying to get an air burst. <laughs> 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 anyway, we <laughs> pulled, pulled the fuse on that thing and pitched it out the window. <laughs> and we, <clears throat> we, we thought it was going to be a, a big explosion. Well, and this little tiny puff of black smoke comes easy out of the, out of the jungle down there. But, uh, you know, with all those nails flying around in the bottom of that uh, jungle, that that wouldn't be fun for anybody that was down or anything rather, oh, no. but it was, it was that kind of stuff that, that we did. Probably my, um, my most memorable operations and there were many. And, uh, the one that just really stays in my mind, there was a, um, uh, uh, a company slam that was, um, was that that operation was ordered and they put a full company in on the bra and um not yeah. far from that location there was a um a uh, artillery battery uh it was a composite battery at at ben het and it's and it's set up on top of the hill when i when i'm saying a composite battery it had four uh 105 uh howitzers in there it had two eight inch and two 175 howitzers in there and the only um the only uh tubes that would reach uh that area where where the our troops were at the good guys were at uh were the 175s the problem with the 175s were those were uh, converted naval tubes and they had a range probable error at max range of 100 meters. Oh. Well, when you're trying to work artillery rounds in close to uh, danger close, that 100 meter um, range error uh, is is kind of tough to do. But once you get once you get the first round in there, uh, and you can figure out where you're going from there. But during that uh, during that onslaught that that they put those guys in on the ground and the, and the bad guys let them sit there for about a day. And then they amassed a, a huge number of troops. And, and basically that's when the King Bee helicopter was, was taken out uh, by an RPG on right on the, uh, yeah. right on, the, uh, on, on the LZ took out, uh, um, one of my favorite medics down there um, and, and a number of the wounded that they were trying to get out. The, uh, that, that was a tough day. And uh, I uh, was adjusting artillery and coordinating that with the airstrikes and, and the gunships. Uh, they had a Covey rider up there at that particular period in time. And we were coordinating because you, you, if you had fighters coming in, you couldn't have artillery rounds dropping in between. <laughs> so it, it was a it was a coordinated um, effort, but we finally we finally were able to get enough fire on on the target down there to withdraw that full um, company of people down there. But that was that was. You know, a, a lot of times you'd hear 
the uh, the teams running through the bushes, and you could actually hear the dogs that were in per- pursuit of them on the mics. And uh, you know that, that gives you gives you chills. But that's also when you're the calmest. You know, um, I you know I appreciated uh, what Fra- uh, Frank was talking about. You know the fear of what we were doing. I didn't experience any of that fear until after I got home. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's when you begin to really think about, Oh shit. Did that really happen? You know? And, uh, that's when I started drinking the, uh, crown Royal and milk that Frank mentions in the book. <laughs> that's a wild mix, crown yeah. oil and milk, right there. That that's a that's a oh, acquired good. taste. <laughs> it, was, it was it was good, <laughs> but uh, no, I uh, you know the Frank and 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 Phil. I'm I'm sorry, Phil isn't on board here, and uh, and Doug, uh, truly truly courageous men, and. Uh, yeah, I'd go to war with them anytime. I think we've. Uh... Yeah. Okay, I go ahead. You know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, bud. Oh no, I'm. I, I was just uh, about to just ramble. You, you go ahead. Yeah, that absolutely. Was, go ahead. Interesting. You asked Rex about how to not get shot down, and I in. Um, emailing uh, Ray Carl, and Ray was my instructor at Bird Dogs at Rucker. He was a cat killer, and he came back, and and he taught me how to fly the bird dog. Anyway, we reconnected after the first podcast. I was so surprised to see him, but we discussed this very thing. Um, How do you not get shot down? And I asked him, I said, didn't it occur to anyone at the Department of Fixed Wing at Rucker to talk about this stuff because they never did. And so when we went flying, um, you know, you, you first time you go up there and you're kind of general wrong in a, in a straight line, you're not varying your altitude. Nobody tells you anything. And next thing you know, bow, pow, 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 pow. And now what? So then I asked you and you said, fly crooked. And it suddenly occurred to me that these were all the things that we had to do. And and I was so surprised when you said that, what that led me then to figure out. Um, and it didn't take long. Like, not like... <laughs> yeah, when you hear that like, pop, 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 it didn't take long. Pop, 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 right. <laughs> well, <laughs> think of something now, pal. But it's, it's keeping, keeping the wheels in the trees. And, and and skidding around a turn when you're that low because you don't want to put the wing down and get get the wing tip caught in in, in the treetops. I mean, but they, but none of this was ever covered, none of it. Well, and, you know what the you know what the rules were, Frank. We were told you cannot fly below fifteen hundred feet. Well, shoot, that's you the cannot see up. anything above fifteen hundred. You couldn't see anything. You couldn't. Yeah. You, what were you, why were you out there? You, yeah. you couldn't find a goddamn thing at fifteen hundred feet. Yeah. yeah. You know well, I mean? but but you're you're also in the kill zone. You know, any anybody anybody with uh, with a twelve point seven machine gun can take you out in a heartbeat. That's right. That's exactly right. So th- the one day when Plaster was sitting behind me and well, I heard this one pump pump going on and and I asked him if he was jiggling his knee and he said no and well no because it was that 12.7 was pumping away at us it had a real <laughs> slow rate of fire i knew what the hell it was i thought jesus christ and i i you know my first inclination was i, I gotta climb out of here and i then i said oh no no we're not doing that we're staying right here and we're going like hell in the opposite direction but it it it's that sort of thing that was never mentioned and so if you're lucky to live through the first surprise because that's what it is when you start taking ground fire right. for that very first right. time, that surprise. Then you start to calculate, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And, and and I don't know about you, John, but I remember teaching this Vietnamese kid in my backseat how to land. Now, I couldn't get him to land an airplane, but I could get him to fly it. 
and I, I got him, I could get him down to about 10 feet off the runway. And I figured we went slow enough going to 10 feet off the ground. And I was, yeah, hurt. he put it down. We may roll up in a ball, but I had a chance of surviving. Otherwise right. I did it. So teach him how to fly. Yeah. We did Something. that with Frank. Oh, anybody was in the back seat. I had yeah. him pull up the pedals and, and put the, put the stick in. So that's, that, that, that's always interesting to hear about. And of course there's Mr. Frank with an RPD right there. Yep. <laughs> um, did you, uh, you said you had, uh, uh, didn't you have a, a, a nice funny story on, on Mr. Frank? Yeah, that was the bomb that I mentioned earlier. Oh, the bomb story. Okay, yeah. great. I'm, and, and, I'm and glad Frank, about that. Would, uh, <laughs> I, I, if I remember right, Frank was that M79 that had been chopped all down, mm -hmm. pistol size. Oh, yeah. His pirate gun. <laughs> and it was, was, it, was, it, was, it was it was the safety slide that cut my hand. Oh. You remember how that? Yeah. How that, it was, it was a slide and it was, it was right in this uh, portion of your hand when you had when you had your hand around. That's that's what it did. But I I put some tape around it and built a so that when the thing went off, it wouldn't uh, catch my uh, catch my flesh after that. Um, I, and you mentioned uh, Mr. Bruce Besser. Uh, sadly, he was shot down, as you said, May 13th, 1969, uh, with cover writer Mike Scott. And uh, they are both men are still MIA uh, as, as of now, uh, sadly. And uh, mm -hmm. you also miss, mentioned Mr. Uh, Rex Hill. And I've actually got that photograph of uh, what, that you mentioned with him being shot up. Uh, with that 37 yeah. Mike, Mike, I believe. Uh, yeah. He's, uh, yep, there it is. There it is. And he, he, he brought that thing back and landed it. That, I, I can't, I mean, what's it like? I mean, I can only, it's, it's a small aircraft, so any amount of damage alters the flying uh, uh, ability. But, I mean, I could only imagine this had to be pretty difficult to get back home with. Yes. Yeah, he, he he explained that to me. He said, "Yeah, I was, I was, I was fighting it all the way." Yeah. Man, what that uh, that just shows y'all were in some hairy, hairy necks of the wood right there. Um, were were you uh actually? I believe this is. I don't know whose aircraft this was. I've got one of uh Mr. Hill or somebody when they crashed into. Uh, the jungle and ended up getting rescued, but that's one of the bird dogs coming off. Uh, I, I believe their landing. I think he actually came in hot and something was wrong, and they ended up crash landing. I'll need to investigate more on that photo. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know who that was. You is there a date or a timestamp on the photo, Bud? That is actually what I was going to right then to check out. Uh, Y'all bear with me one second. Um, did Mr. Uh, uh, there was somebody else that crash landed, and uh, I'm trying to well, think who it was. If Nick Bales put it in a in a bunker, in a in a bomb crater rather, and um, uh, he was flying with um, Pete Johnson on that a dual ship mission, and and it was Bell's first mission. Oh, and and he and 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 he was told not to turn to that looks like that that's his airplane. I think yep. that's 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 Bale's airplane. Yeah. Yeah, Sinkowski's airplane. I think, he, I think what he did was he tried to set set it down with the tail first, stall it out over the thing and, and yeah. let it fall in on its tail. Yeah. And um he got they got him out. And uh, I mean, they, the NBA were running down the road. They were practically on top of him, but they did get him out. And he, he got back to uh, CCC and packed his bags. We, ne we never saw him again. He went back yeah. and he became a supply officer. So that's, oh. that's it. And then he went, well, and Jeff went to for United Airlines. Joe Curley uh, left the mission too. I, now, I didn't know that. Yeah, he, 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 he took a hellacious bunch of ground fire. 
and he went back. Joe Curley was was my uh, classmate in flight school, and uh, when I went to uh, when I went to the uh, pterodactyls, he uh, he was he was real happy. I'm going to go where the real action is and be up here with the headhunters. And the next thing I knew, uh, when I when I came through uh, play coup on the way to Contum, he's he's sit, sitting there in the doghouse. He says. John, I'm not sure you want to go up there. <laughs> so, what well, what was uh since y'all were both at CCS, I've actually got a picture of a bird dog at CCS. Um and they were they were the pterodactyls, correct? Instead of right. uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And y'all were Okay, and y'all were literally doing the pretty much the exact same thing down there. Well, it was more radio relay when I was there. Right, okay. and me too. We were picking up and messages was, from the teams and, and relay them back. I was not I was not with the 185th. I was with the 219th. But somehow they were operating out of a place called Duco. And so Dawn Ship said, go do this. And I, I, uh, I got about a two-minute briefing from this uh, Air Force major whose call sign was Covey. And uh, off we went to Cambodia. And you're right, John. It was it was like a like a a griddle kit. I mean, it was just flat. There was no relief at all. And no. um, and and not heavily treed either. Um, it, it did what didn't look jungly to me. Uh, no, it wasn't. Yeah. No. And then the other thing I used to see all the time coming back from missions with. CCC, if I got down that far south, would I would see a lot of the um, either the 123s spray an Agent Orange, and I stayed way the hell away from that, or I watched the um, C-130s kicking uh, big canisters of av gas out the back and uh, uh, blowing the av gas up when it hit the ground. Catch it in on fire. So I guess it was cat contaminated fuel and they were pitching it out. Oh. You remember how short that field was, right? Yeah. We had uh, while felt. I was while I was there, they had a 123 uh make an emergency landing there. And you remember where the chain link, not chain link fence, but it was hog wire fence at one right. end of the runway. Yeah. His nose was right up against. <laughs> <laughs> and and the deal was, I don't know how we're going to get this thing out. You know, because they had two, they had two a turning and two burning, two jet yeah. engines and two yeah. I don't know. I you know, and and everybody was laughing because we couldn't use the, uh, we had to use the taxiway to get get our birds off the ground. He had that thing parked right up against the against the fence down there. Oh God! <laughs> the uh, uh, Mr. John, the 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 hatchet force uh, or the slam operation you were on uh, or uh, were were flying with uh, was that the one? Um, I believe it was. This is a photo flight of the hatchet force near uh, one ten highway one ten. Um, was 16, that sixteen eighteen? Yeah. That was grid square 6019. Oh, wow. I want to write that down. Um, was that, do, do you just happen to remember a name? Uh, this is the a photo of Operation Halfback in 1969 when Wayne, uh, uh, medic William Boyle uh, was KIA that's, in the King B. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay. So, uh, wow. That, that can't believe that is the, the the photo we actually found. And that is in, uh, guys, that is in, I've got another one I'll bring up. And that yeah. is in Mr. Frank Greco's epic book. It's crazy expensive, but if you guys can afford it, it is one of the. I, I wish I'd have known he'd had that out because that, well, that, that thing should be republished. <laughs> Sadly, uh, the company closed down and there's no more rights to it. So he, he, he just gave up. I think he's got, he had the chance to do it. And when the company folded, he just gave up and, and really doesn't, he really doesn't even talk SOG. I, I email him every once in a while to check in, but he's pretty much over it. I hate that because a lot of people would, 
would really enjoy this book, especially since a limited number were printed. So, yeah, um, if if you could, if 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 you could send me his uh, uh, email address, I'd I'd really like to message him because he's, yeah, he spent a lot of time in my back seat, and I and he's one guy that I got along with real well. I will absolutely do that, and especially considering uh he he was flying in your back seat um yeah. absolutely i'll get that to you when we get offline today okay. um there's a couple so, there's a couple of people that i'd like to uh, mention here because absolutely it, it was a real real honor to to have served with them absolutely uh, one 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 individual was uh, uh bob howard he oh. was a medal of honor recipient and uh he he had been um nominated for the medal twice on three two times. different actions two different actions three times three times i think yeah yes, well anyway he was he was he was still at ccc when i arrived so i had the opportunity to, to meet with him shortly i mean that that guy was was uh uh if if you want to see a guy that is hollywood's notion of a true hero that's him I mean, uh, looks, character, demeanor, everything else. There he is. And uh, he uh, uh, he was gone within, I guess, days or a week of, of my arrival up there. And he, even, even the day that I got there, uh, Colonel Apt was fussing at him and really dressing him down because what he was trying to do is get on a helicopter one of the teams was in trouble out in the field and he was trying to get on a helicopter when they were trying to get him back to give him his medal. And, and I, oh, it was, it was really kind of funny, but anyway, they finally got him out of country. And, uh, I, um, I have volunteered to, to extend my first extension for six months. And, uh, to, to be able to go to, to jump school. That was, that was my, my bargain with the army. Well, when I de out and went back and went to Fort Benning to, um, uh, go to jump school, guess who the ground commander was? Bob Howard. Bob Howard. Yeah. He was, he had been, he had gotten a direct commission to captain and uh, was was there taking taking the boys through their their ground training, so that was uh, and uh, here again I wound up being the uh, the trainee leader for for that airborne class. So <laughs> that 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 was that was really really something. Anyway, Fred Fred Apt uh, was was a guy that was a a classic uh, commander. He didn't get into the uh, get into the business of every, everybody else's business. He was basically the guy that uh, was on the blame line for for what his subordinates were doing, and he let his subordinates run the place. Uh, one of those subordinates was Major Leitz, who was the three, the, the uh, S three, and Major Jax, who was the S two. Major Jax was. Uh, wound up as the postmaster at Fort Bragg. Oh, wow. So, you know, you, you're, you're talking about some of these people that, uh, that, um, y you know, you want to get a, a composite of, of who these people were that were running the, uh, SOG camps, the assistant, uh, um, uh, S3 was a man by the name of Don Dahl. Yeah, there's Jax there. <laughs> Winning poker as usual. Yeah. Now, when he was a captain, he also ran recon. Mm -hmm. So oh, I mean, yeah. they, they weren't they weren't. Uh, I mean that 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 thing went on and on. So um, another um, medal recipient was uh, Frankie Delano Miller. Um, I was trying to remember what his uh, RT was. Vermont. Vermont. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then of course, Frank Greco, but those are the guys that, uh, that I really, Oh, the kibitz with all the time. 
this Staff Sergeant Karate Davis. Does that name come up in? H Howard Karate Davis, oh, yeah. Co <laughs> Covey Rider Extraordinaire. Yeah, he was he was a Covey Rider. Yeah. There's Doug and Ed there, Walkoff. Yeah. That's down and at Long Ton at the one zero school. I heard uh I heard uh App say uh to uh to uh Frankie Miller one time. He says, Now you're you gotta remember your mission. And uh the mission is to you're on a prisoner snatch, and this time we would like to have you bring that prisoner back alive. <laughs> 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 uh, it, it's hard i mean honestly people don't understand how hard it is especially you know when when you've got mountain yards that absolutely hate the the north vietnamese and uh it, it uh it that, that's just hilarious we, we'd love oh, yeah. to have him back if possible <laughs> actually but you could you could leave the north part off of the vietnamese my That's right. It's being the main period. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I forgot about that. Yeah, me. I've got a good photo I'll bring up of uh, Colonel Apt, and uh, we we've heard from a lot of the recon guys. I actually know one that uh, he crossed the fence for an afternoon with one of the men I know, but a uh, hell of a basketball player and a WW two guerrilla war fighter over in uh, in Europe. Uh, it, it just outstanding. Uh, man and outstanding leader from all the guys, including you guys that we've spoken to that had contact with him. Just an who absolute. Was, who was the guy standing with Apt here? That's uh, Sergeant Major, well, now Sergeant Major Reynold Pope from RT Iowa. Yeah, I, I, I remember him. You know, he worked, um, in, he worked in Intel after he uh, quit running recon. So I'm sure you, you guys crossed paths with him. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't remember his name. But uh, Colonel Apt uh, was very seriously wounded in, in uh, Korea. Oh, he, I did not know that. Yeah, he took a concussion, a concussion grenade, and it left a big hole right about where his kidneys were on the right side. Yeah. And uh, we, were, we were playing volleyball or some dang thing, and, and he had his shirt off, and that's when I saw it, and I, I asked him about it. But he he got that in Korea. What a what a what a guy! Well, I mean, these these guys these guys we served with uh, are real warriors. There's no question about it. All of you guys. I mean, uh, not just the guys you served with or y'all served with. Both both of you are in that picture as well. I mean, it, it's unbelievable the stuff we've read and heard from you guys that 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 y'all were doing. Um, we you had. Go, go ahead. ahead. I, I, no, no, I was going to, we were going to get into questions. Go ahead. If you've got something oh, to say, the floor well, is yours, sir. This, uh, he, what sometimes gets lost in a translation is that when you think about how dangerous their mission was, these guys that were on the ground, you get off a helicopter at an LZ and you're crawling around on the ground and no one's making a sound. The whole thing is orchestrated. And pretty soon the helicopters fly away. And then the, the your, your overhead air cover is probably gone. And then the cubby flies away. And then we fly away. And now you're all by yourself. And there's and, and you're just out there. And at night, there's nobody to talk to. Um, you can't call anybody up on a radio. And and can you you know just think about laying there in 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 an ambush position, and you can you can hear the NVA moving around, you can hear the dogs, you can hear occasional gunshot for location, all of that, and 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 somehow you wake you 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 get up the next day and put the next foot out in front of you and and move along and complete a mission or run like hell to get to an LZ because the mission's been compromised. That takes amazing courage, amazing courage. I mentioned Buckland one time that, you know, I said, I, I, I wish I had a five bucks for every time I, I crossed the border. And, 
you know, we went over every day. And then I, I said to him, the, the, the teams, the guys that ran around down there, they went every other week or something like that. And he said, oh, no, no, there's no, there's no comparing one to the other. It's totally different. It's totally different. You yep. came back at night and they didn't. They stayed there. And they were there for two days, five days, however long the mission ran, or if they were compromised, how quickly they could get out, that kind of thing. And I thought about it for a while. I said, Jesus Christ, Mike, you're exactly right. It never, it never occurred to me that it was that intense because I was so wrapped up in what I was doing. And so now to think about that, I, I, it, it put everything in context for me. It put everything in context. And I, I, I remember watching, I forget what Wilson's name was, his first name, but Baby Huey. And I, I met him, oh, yeah. Fat Albert, sorry, Fat Albert. Uh, and I met him, I met him just a couple of times. But here's this guy rolling around on the floor of the bar and just, just being a wild man. And I thought, you know, this guy's, this guy's crazy. Well, I'd be crazy too if I was running around in the jungle like he was and, and, and doing what he was doing. And so, yeah. Every, he, everybody, everybody on that camp had their form of craziness. Oh. That's right. Exactly. And, and, and it just, you know, you take somebody like, uh, like Frankie Miller. I mean, he was just so quiet, deadly quiet. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And I, the, night the, the night the Glasshouser broke into, into I yeah, know, Glasshouser. Glasshouser, Glasshouser broke into our hooch and he crumbled an entire package of saltines on me. And, and I, I thought, I thought, I felt, I felt like a chicken that was about to get sautéed. I was going to be kidding me. And he's, he's laughing his ass off, and he's telling me it's time to pay the piper. And I have no idea what he's talking about, but I am covered from head to toe with crushed up saltines. And I thought, I'm gonna get you, pal. <laughs> his, call really sign, his, his call sign was Wolfgang, and I, I okay. called him, yes. I called him Wolfie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He told me he told me that was going to be the the, the name of his firstborn son, Wolfgang. And I thought, yeah, right. You're going to get that one by your wife. <laughs> oh, God, he was funny. He was that. Uh, he's that was the one funny. of the most. He's the one one of the most unassuming men, especially nowadays. When when you talk yeah. to him, just so slow and easy going. I mean. Uh, and some of the stories, it's almost like two different people that I hear from you guys and from the recon men. It's just like I'm sure you, I'm sure you do get that that thing because I, I think the thing same thing can be said for both Frank and myself. Yeah. That the people that knew us on a daily basis back then probably wouldn't recognize the personalities now. That is a that, very good point. There was a guy that came. Right before I went home, there was a guy that came in. He was a he was a captain at, at down at two nineteenth, and I was in the officers' club having dinner, and um, he came and sat down next to me, and I, you know I was enjoying my my solitude, and uh, he plops down and he said, "They told me to come over and introduce myself to you," and I said, "Well, how are you? Who are you?" And he told me his name. And he said, yeah, I want to come and talk to you because they told me that you are a real hard ass. And I, <laughs> and I said, they did? He said, yeah, and that you were real hard-boiled, too. You were really hard-boiled. And I wasn't sure exactly what he meant by that, but it didn't sound good. And I thought, well, okay, I'm just going to humor you here, pal. But I thought, you know, I, I was minding my own business. And, 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 you know, this guy comes over and tells me I'm a hard ass and hard-boiled and Glasshouser covers me with saltine crumbs. I don't know. <laughs> what I do? What an introduction there. It's like, hey, I want to try and not have you treat me like a like an asshole and, and be mean to me like everyone's told me you are. So, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> okay. It couldn't be um, me. I was an older boy. I went to Catholic school. Like, it couldn't be yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, are you sure you got the same guy? I, I, we've got to be confusing somebody. Uh I, I wanted to show this photo. This is another photo from uh, Mr. Frank Greco's. And it's, it's uh, I believe this is a chopper pilot actually getting into 
tracers. You see them firing yeah. off their rockets with tracers coming in. I mean, is this what y'all were seeing? Is this how, how it would look when they would open up on you guys with all the all the fire like this coming in? Or could y'all even see it that high up coming until it was too late? Oh, those tracers are green. They came yeah. with green. Right. It was green tracers. The, you know, uh, you saw them. And, they, and when they went by the cockpit, you heard them because it was like somebody took a, a Zippo and snapped the lid open. And that uh, he's, up, is, he's up pretty good. Whoever took that picture is up pretty high, too, because yeah. you're, you're already getting the descending arc in, in right. the stuff. Yeah. And that looks like that, that, that thick white stripe over there looks like it could be a minigun. Sure does. Yeah, should, that should be, we've got. That, that's what it looked like. But I think Drawing I think that that, I think that's coming from the air to the ground. Uh, that one, yes, that would be minigun from uh, maybe yeah. a Cobra. Right. Fifty-one and well, uh, fifty-one caliber coming up at them with tracers. Uh, they're firing two point seven five inch rockets, and I can't. It cut off the other side. Very well, could be minigun. Y'all know way better than I would, especially what some shooting that into the jungle looks like. That I thought that was an amazing picture grab of whoever the heck had the, the cojones to take that picture in that moment because that's a lot of stuff coming at you. What was that what you, I mean I, I and we get a question. I need to start looking at questions, but how hard is it? I'll get a better one. Um how hard is it to I mean I know early on you of course you're not going to be all that good, but Let's just take, for instance, this photo of the bra. I mean, I know you probably didn't get many troops there, but I mean, with with this terrain and and the woods and all of that, how do you train to to spot not only enemy walking, gun emplacements, trucks, maybe? I mean, how how, how are y'all eagle eyeing that well? I mean, that that seems well, pretty first, tough. First of all, you you got quite a bit of altitude here. Yeah. And so if, if I'm looking for something, I'm sure as hell not going to be flying at that altitude. I'm going to be a whole lot lower because I need to be able to see sideways through that jungle. And so that's, that's not going to work. Um, and, and John would, would probably know more about it than me, but this, I, I the last thing I'd say about the bra was this is the first, this, this is where you and I went on the, on the very first mission that I flew with you. Yeah. And, and you, oh. <laughs> And I thought, this, what's the matter with this guy? <laughs> Why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> and there, there, that, that's why it's called the bras, guys. Everyone asks why, and it yeah. looks like a, a nice cup, uh, if you will. Well, there were two of them. It, it was yeah. a, little, yeah. a couple of boobs. Right. A <clears throat> couple, couple of boobs. Um, I do have a, a better one. Um, no, you do know, you have anything to share, Mr. At altitude, though, you could tell if they were moving foliage around. Yeah, you, that you when, could tell. When you get up, up, up above it, you could so see the difference in the foliage if they were cutting it to uh, for any purpose, you know, to to uh, camouflage or whatever. You could see the difference because, and it didn't take long either. If it was cut yesterday, it would show you today where yeah. where they had cut. You know, the leaves would start turning backwards or whatever and, and become discolored. You could tell what was going on down there. So when y'all are looking, I mean, are y'all are literally swooping in like when y'all are taking the picture of uh, the the Cambodian prime minister? I mean, y'all are at treetop level. I mean, low, 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 like picking limbs out of y'all's uh, struts when y'all get back and landing gear and such. Yeah. God Almighty! I mean, jeez. I, well, you know, a, we were we were we were flying uh, things that uh, you know when when you flying something that really doesn't match the requirements of the of the uh, of the mission, you got to imp improvise. <laughs> I mean, that thing that thing. was well in some cases I think some of our
I think we're freezing here. There I we think. go. We got him back now. Okay. You kind of froze out on us there for a second. Uh, uh, and, didn't um, realize it. It's it's fun. It it happens every now and again. Um, let me see. Uh, I've have been negating all of the uh the questions here. Let me see if we've got any right. real quick. Um, bu- 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 Jason. Um, incredible to think that this is a live interview. There is also a man who is on the ground in the slam operation in the live chat. Always good to have. Um, okay, yes. Back. Yep. Um, <laughs> I've been told Bud's my bastard stepchild. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Terry. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Terry said, greatest respect to all of our uh, SOG Air support. Absolutely. Uh, I I know from speaking to uh, men on the ground uh, that they, they put high praise on the men we're speaking to today, that many of them would not have made it home to their families uh, and had a life w- without these guys up in the air covering their, their rear ends. Uh, so, Absolutely. Um, well, we don't have any questions. I think everybody's just enjoying the talk. Do y'all have anything you, Oh, before we forget, uh, how about the, uh, Tipperillos? Uh, story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, on prior to us going live on the show here, I made mention of the fact that, uh, Bud was, uh, smoking a Tipperillo. And I asked, uh, Frank, if he remembered that I smoked Tipperillos all all the time that I was flying airplanes over there. And uh, I said, uh, do you remember why? And they so asked me to hold the story. But the, the real reason why I smoked Tipperillas is because I could hold that thing in my mouth no matter what was going on outside that aircraft while I was flying it. And the reason being, the lesson uh, that I learned, I was smoking cigarettes when I first went over there. And while flying the airplane, I dropped one in between my legs. <laughs> <laughs> and he got busy inside that aircraft real quick <laughs> trying to get that doggone thing out of there. So, yeah, uh, I smoked up rolls all the time I was over there for that reason. Did, yeah. did you burn yourself up at all? Were you able to get it out before the cigarette I, caused it, any? It, it got a little hot there, but not bad. I've, I've, Lord knows I've done that as well. Uh, that wasn't my reason for uh, switching. Um, I quit for a while and ended up needing something because I was always nervous talking to you guys, so I picked up the bad habit. Um, Alex is saying he's got a big uh, – I do have a fear of heights as well. Uh, it's he's, he's crippling fear of climbing ladders. These guys are a special breed of man. Lovely to hear their perspective from high in the sky. Absolutely. We've uh, – Got so many recon guys giving us the the uh, the point of view from the ground. It's unbelievable what these men were facing in the air. Um, great question. Um, can you talk about both of you? Uh, what was your most proud contribution to the war effort for any specific mission you were on uh, that you were most proud of? Go for it, Frank. Um, I I would. I would think that uh, there would be two, I believe, and one was after the war, going back to Rucker and instructing from the bird dog, in the bird dog from the back seat. And I did spend time with the kids that I was instructing, uh, talking about how to fly this airplane in combat. And I'm glad that I did that. In Vietnam, um, about two thirds of the way through my my time at CCC, going back over and finding a section of the road that we'd been looking for for weeks and couldn't figure out where the hell it went. And I found it in a, a gorge that was sort of a valley that was so narrow, um, the two ridge lines that I couldn't turn the airplane in it. And so I Dutch rolled it down this thing looking and I found the first of what I counted to be 47 bridges, which crisscrossed this gorge and got a couple of F4s in there and we blew three of the bridges. I went back the next morning. Um, it came back from a different direction. As John said in the very beginning, you don't, it don't retrace your steps. So I thought, how did I go in there yesterday? I'm going into this way today and got a look and I could see that they were all rebuilt. And I, I realized the, the futility of, of what was happening to us now that these people were tenacious and they were never going to give up. And, and I, I thought, you know, well, what are you going to do now? 
I mean, you, you can't quit here just because they rebuilt three bridges. And I thought, well, I'm here for him, Myers and Phillips and, and Kraut and, 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 uh, and and the guys that I I flew on the ground, Bucky and and uh, um, and, and Glasshauser and Krupa, just just to, to 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 see that my friends got home, to see that everybody survived, that we got out of this. And regardless of what your feelings were about the war, could we win it? Could we not win it? It didn't much matter. It it was where are you directing your attention? Where are you going to put your love? And I'm. I'm putting it with the with with my with my pals, with the guys that I'm with every day, that I I I want them to survive, and I want them to keep me alive as well, and that's that's kind of a rambling around the corner kind of description of what I was proud of, but that's what I'm proud of. To illustrate that, I guess one of the things that uh, kind of grabbed my heart was uh, one of the teams was extracted, but there were uh, one guy was separated from the team during the ex extraction and was left out there in the AO. And um, we kept looking, looking for him. And uh, I guess about two days later, I uh, got a mirror flash from the ground. And uh, so... I was a little bit hesitant to follow up on that, but it, it looked, um, I don't know. I just had a feeling that it, it was our guy that, that got left. And so I, I called a uh, team and, 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 and the gunships and we went in there and pulled him out without, without incident. He had gotten far enough away where we weren't in, near anybody. And that, you know, to to not, I guess, I guess, you know, I had a feeling that it was our right guy, and the the slick drivers, you know, they took my word for it. I said, look, I th I really think this is our guy, and and the gunships were there. It's kind of a a, a, a bet against a, a bad decision, and uh, you know that that's a lot of faith when you've got no direct communication with the guy. Yeah, you know, exactly. Mountain, mountain yard guy. So we pulled him out and we got, <laughs> we got him back to camp. And I, I, I'll tell you what, there was a, there was a big celebration in, in, in the yard. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, that's just one of those things. And, you know, one of, one of the, I got to remark on one other thing that came out of your book, uh, Frank, and that was uh, your experience with the um, with the orphanage, and then running into that little girl later. Oh, yes. I mean, how does that happen? That's got to be a God thing, you know. It really does. It does. It it had to be. Yeah. It truly had to be. It it was really quite something, and I've I've never forgotten it. And I still have it. I I told this to Bud. I still have a note. In English, and I don't know who helped, who helped Sister Angela write it, but it was on my Christmas card. I have it from her. I saved that. It's been what uh, over fifty years, and I I still have that stuff. I mean, I I when I saw that girl and I and I started talking to her, and she told me who she was, and I I I thought I almost passed out in the, in the rear galley. <laughs> I, like, I, I can imagine. Really, and, and you know, I'm, and I'm driving. So you can't, you can't pass out. You got to get. <laughs> so, oh yeah, that yeah, was really great. Crazy. Um, anyway, we've got a few good questions in here. Uh, could either of you talk about the scariest moment you've experienced in flight, whether that caused by enemy fire or any type of plane malfunction or what have you? Go ahead, John. Like I said earlier, uh, when all of the angry lead was flying, I was doing what I was trained to do. I didn't get scared. If I if I had any feelings afraid of oh crap, what what what's going on? 
I, it happened after. And uh, I even had a couple of sessions where I went went back and very, very privately had a uh, tear session. Uh, you know, it just, uh, and I drank pretty heavily too back then <laughs> to try to shake some of this stuff off. So, um, but while it was going on, you just do what you're trained to do. Got no time I, to be scared, really. Yeah. I, I concur. I, I absolutely agree with you. You just, uh, you compartmentalize and you hone in and, and you, your, 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 your scope gets really narrow and you're in on this thing and nothing else distracts or detracts from that. That's what you do. So, and, 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 and a key off of something you said earlier, uh, uh, Frank, you're doing this for people that you love and care about. Right. Yep. I think that when Phil and I got shot up so badly and Armstrong got killed, I wasn't afraid until later. And and when we when we were flying back to uh, Doc Toe with uh, Armstrong in the back of Phil's airplane, and then and then the realization of what had occurred really bothered me. The only time that I was really frightened, um, and because it was from surprise, was coming out of Cambodia and looking back over my shoulder and seeing a T twenty eight with Cambodian markings. This guy's chasing me, and he's got he's got hard points under the wings. And he's got he's got machine guns down there, and and he wants me to surrender. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> no. Not Not I've got one. It's, something's coming back to me right now. And you talk about scared while in flight. Yeah. This issue, I got caught out in the AO right at, right at dark. We were we were extracting uh, a, a team that was came out of a hot LZ, and we got the, we got the team out, and uh, they were they were going they had a wounded on board so they were going down to play coup, and I was going back to Contum. Well, a fog came in as well, and not only. Not only was it dark, but at Contum, there was a. Um, help me out, Frank. There was there was a a radar strip. They could give you glide slope, and uh, you could give you a GCA. So the yeah, a ground control GCA. GCA. And I was coming back, and and there's no lights on the runway at at uh, Contum at all. They did have they did have five gallon cans half filled with uh, with sand that they poured diesel fuel in to act as daylight. Anyway, just off of the approach end of the uh, of the runway there, there's a big dead old oak tree, huge thing. You remember that? Yes. Anyway, they're talking me in. And yeah, I was I was afraid because I didn't know whether I was going to hit the tree, whether they were going to steer me around the tree, uh, and uh, and bring me in. I was low on fuel. There was no way that I could do a go around. And uh, they did bring me right in, and I made I made a safe landing. And then when when I started taxi toward the taxiway, I ran out of gas. Right there on the runway. Oh. So, Frank, when he talks about me in, in his book, he says, I don't know how John survived all of this stuff. He says, I think God really likes him. <laughs> now, I've got, I, I really do have to give that a second. That's exactly right. It had to be because there was a lot of, <laughs> lot of stuff going on where I could barely <laughs> I love it. That was one of my favorite parts of the book. I love that line. God really liked it. I mean, running out of gas yeah. as soon as you start to taxi. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. That, well, now, you that, know, that was fear while I was in flight. 
because yeah. I didn't know whether I was going to hit that damn tree. I didn't know whether I was going to get on the runway or anything else. Well, because of you, I used to take my map and I would put it in the Ford, cover up the front windows. And I could still see out the side. And I'd call and get a practice GCA from those guys. I used to do it all the time. I said, I'm not going to get caught like Myers. I'm going to learn how to do this right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! Yeah. And are these what y'all's maps kind of looked like, or what, yeah. what were they? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Except they were really big. Oh yeah. 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 Really big. Have you got and the grid squares on there? I used to remember grid square sixty nineteen. No, sixty nineteen would be out. Uh, oh here. Rest of there, yeah. Yeah, there's been hit, so it'd be in the in here. Yeah. Don't. don't see him. I, no, anyway. sir, I don't think we've got the full thing, sadly. Those are, elevation, the full map. those are elevation marks right there. I think Mr. Joe's got the – Joe Parnar's got the full one, and I'll okay. uh, I'll see if I can get that. I'm a big map freak as well as a picture freak. I, I love seeing exactly where y'all were and, of course, love seeing what y'all looked like. But here's yeah. a little overview of where uh, – Y'all's little AO, so to speak, contum right up in here. The launch site right. at Doc Toe. Yep. And Duco would, have been down, Duco would have been down in here. Where? Yeah, Duco would have been by the P and play coup. Right. P. Is where you would have found Duco. Okay. And that was another launch site, correct, for CCS? Yep. I, I believe it was for CCS. Yeah. CCS. Okay. They had CCS, Duco, yeah. Duck Lab. D Duco, Duck Lap. Uh, there was another one I can't remember, and I'm blanking on it. They had a huge uh, French buh, 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 uh, rubber plantation, in it, and I can't believe I'm blanking on the name of it. But I can't remember. Uh, I remember. Uh, Terry's. Uh, I'm, we're, we're talking about getting air and people together. Uh, he's still waiting on a joint budcast with uh, him and Frank to talk about the difference between the air versus the ground. I, if Mr. Frank uh, here, after I get my schedule of scheduled people done, I would love to have you and Frank connect. I think that would be a great show. If Happy, you... to do it. Happy to do Excellent. it. Excellent. And Mr. John, you're always welcome to join us anytime as well. Sure. Absolutely. Um, Jason has a good one. We've started asking this a lot, considering some of the time frame. Uh, he's always interested in WW2's connection to Vietnam. Were there any, ww2 pilots involved in either of your time either in training or with sog or in vietnam not to my knowledge uh you know a lot of, a lot of the people were two war vets and were um uh i ran into one guy uh, on my initial assignment at uh um at, at fort uh, hood texas and uh, he was wearing glider wings, and he he went on on D Day, and yeah, and uh, but that was that, I was a, a second lieutenant when I bumped into him. Glider so, wings, yeah, that is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. The best the best instructor I had in flight school is a guy whose first name I do not know and never have known. And he had, um, his name was Weaver, and I've told you this before. And he had iron gray hair that was slicked back like this, and he chain smoked camels. His cigarette, his his right hand glove was yellow. <laughs> here, and here, that guy, he was the he was the best instructor I have ever had. And he had, he repeated myself. For, he had these little discs that he would put over the instruments on, on in the T forty one, the the Cessna uh, Skyhawk. And you didn't you didn't get to see the airspeed or your altitude or your 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 pitch attitude or anything. He said you're you're going to fly this by the seat of your pants. You're going to fly it by listening to the airplane, and and I'm going to ask you questions and you're going to tell me. And so he'd ask me how high I was, how fast I was going, what how big a bank I thought I was in, and I could I I had to tell him what I felt, not what I saw. Um, and then the but my favorite part of knowing Weaver, Jason was. This was the guy that for he was my instructor for three weeks, 
And I had flunked a check ride because the, the guy that I had previously in this thing was an ass and showed me nothing. And so Weaver taught me everything. So I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of him. Weaver, was that his name? Yeah, with a little titty mustache. And so, he, wow. so he's, he's, um, I can see his here. There we are. I think it's a phone going off. Okay. We'll stop. It should be. There we go. I, yeah, I, was, watch it. I, I had watch a it phone minute. call come through on my. Okay. Well, Weaver's doing this. And, and finally, I screwed up the courage and I asked him, Mr. Weaver, what are you looking for? And and he said, Mr. Schmitz, kid, Mr. Schmitz. That, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> when I got to the air, <laughs> I got to the line, all of the captains that I flew with, uh, all of them were World War II guys, every last one of them. And so they were all my dad's generation. And so I, my father said to me, because we come from a long line of, of Roosevelt Democrats, and, uh, and my dad said to me, only advice I'm going to give you, boy, when you get in that cockpit, is you don't talk about politics because they're not going to like what you have to say. So I never did. <laughs> not going to happen. Not going to get it from me. Anyway, Mr. Schmitz, kid, I will never forget that. <laughs> that's a line right there. That that's that 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 was great reading that in the book, Master Mr. Schmitz, kid, Master Schmitz. Mr. Schmitz. Uh, Jason is curious, did y'all ever bump into or know any guys from the 219th that ever went into some secret like the Ravens or, uh, you know, the Air Force group over there, their CIA group, I should say? We, uh, yeah, yeah. At, at CCC, we were always running into somebody that was on some kind of a black mission that wasn't directly relevant to what CCC was doing. It right. was kind of a passenger uh, stop off for people visiting other people that they knew. And, That's when a uh, city would show up. Yeah, and and there were there were times that we we could have gone over to uh, Thailand for uh, many R and R. That happened. You know, we could we could get anywhere that we really wanted to. As a matter of fact. Um, I went on a set of bogus orders out of Contum to the Philippines and me and a, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of, uh, Charlie Liffick. You remember Charlie Liffick? <laughs> Charlie, anyway, Charlie, Charlie Liffick and I went to the Philippines on a bogus set of orders that Don Ship made and, and our mission <laughs> was to uh, get these uh, little headhunter statues as, <laughs> as going away present for everybody. Well, by the time we got the orders, we had, we had I, it, was, it was some ungodly amount because it also included the enlisted men, not just the officers that we were buying these statues for. The trip to the Philippines was a, a no-brainer. We got there just in time. So we went all over uh, the Philippines looking for these statues because we couldn't buy them all in one place. They were – and and uh, we finally got them out on the uh, on the ramp at, at – at, um, what's the name of that air base there that got covered up with, uh, with uh, the volcano? I forget. In the Philippines, anyway, uh, we went out to the airfield and we're sitting here with this doggone truckload of of, uh, <laughs> of statues, all wrapped in newspaper, and they they perfectly fit on a uh, on a pallet that goes into a C one thirty aircraft. <laughs> anyway, we didn't know how we were going to get back to to end country. So we're sitting out there, Charlie Liffick and I, drinking beer on this pile of head under statues, trying to figure out how we we're going to. I finally, I finally went up to the airfield commander, a full colonel there, Clark Air Force Base, 
That, that was the name of it. Um, and, and I told him the truth. And he was trying to be very stern. And he, finally, he just leaned back in his chair and just started roaring. He says, listen, he says, I, I've got a plane that's taking, i uh, got a C-130 that's taking ports to uh, CCK. Um, if I got you to CCK, uh, it, oh, he says, wait a minute, they're going to they're gonna drop back by Da Nang. Too. And I said, well, you get me in the country and I can, I can, I can get, get down where I'm going. So we started off with CCK and, uh, we're out maybe two, three, four hours. And I suddenly hear that one of the engines quit <laughs> on the C-130. I look out those little port windows there and he's, and sure enough, he's got one of the props feathered. And so I talked to the, to the pilot. He says, yeah, we, we've got no problem getting, getting to CCK. We're almost there anyway. And uh, so we, we land there and they've got to some, they've got to do something with the engine. So that plane is not going to Da Nang anymore. So we sit there for a day or so <laughs> And finally, we get another C-130 that is going to Da Nang. We finally land there. And then I had a, uh, uh, a Chinook take us down to uh, Contum. But that was, but I mean, that was that was funny. I mean, they could have put us in jail for all of that mess. Bogus, oh. bogus travel flight papers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Y'all yeah. yeah. were running and gunning. <laughs> um, this oh, one's sure. always in it. Oh, go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You go. You go. Go. What's your question? Um, I, I always like when we ask uh, Vietnam pilots this. Uh, gosh, where did that great question go? Hang on. I'm, I apologize about this, guys. Oh, here we go. Baz is wondering if you guys could pilot any modern aircraft from today back into SOG days, what would y'all use as y'all's aircraft that you could use back then? Would you, what would you fly, Jeff? You go. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, the aircraft was was uh, was old, but it it did the job for us. And I anything fast, anything anything faster, well, I don't think we could have done the job. No, and it you know that. When when we went to see it at the at the Smithsonian, when I took Katie out to Chantilly to the annex, and yeah. she looked she looked at it, she looked at me, and she looked back at the airplane, and she looked back at me, and she said, "You are fucking nuts." <laughs> so, I, I I got those same looks too. <laughs> but but everything you asked of that airplane, it did. Everything right. you expected from it, it gave you. And and so when I ended the book, I said that we got home because of that airplane. That gallant yep. little airplane saved my life. And I thought, you know, there are a million things I would have loved to have flown. There were a lot of airplanes that I got to fly. I mean, you, if Boeing made it, I flew it. But, yeah. but that airplane, it was, it was so perfect for what we were doing. You never thought about flying it. You simply put it on like a shoe, and and yeah, it did exactly what you asked right. it to do. You could it, that I I I'm not trading that. What, why would I fly an OV-10 Bravo? It goes too damn fast. And I'm not, I, what do I need the guns for? I, I, I'm too scared. To, <laughs> um, no, I just, I just, I'm not interested. I, the, I had what I wanted. I had what I needed. And it did, it you know, did for me. When, for when, when we flew, when we flew that little bird, our focus and, and concentration was what we were looking at and what was going on on the radios. Everything else we were doing to fly the aircraft 
was second nature. It was really like, yeah, you okay. didn't think about, you know, okay. do I need more power or anything? Your hands just did what, what you, you were did. feeling in your butt. That's what I was wondering. I didn't even think about the speed negating the entire mission of what y'all were doing. So that takes out a, a lot of. It was like when I got to fly that thing last spring, just by chance from the back mm -hmm. seat. And I, and, and, and all I did was pop the rudder pedals up and we put the stick in and I couldn't see the, the engine. I didn't even, I didn't even bother trying to look. I just sat there and, and, and he turned around and looked at me and he said, you ain't bad. <laughs> oh, if you only knew. <laughs> yeah. Were you flying with Phil? Who were you flying with? I, there was a guy up in Westerly, Rhode Island. They had two of them. He was towing banners up and down a beach. And I, I, I went over to the airport. I said, well, I got a thousand hours in that airplane. He said, come on. So off we went. And it was just like, it was like getting back on a bike. It was so cool. And I, and John, when I got out of the thing, I cried. Oh I yeah, I, I just. You know when 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 I left Play Coup, now you'll laugh at this. I, I had my gear. This is when I was getting ready to go out of country. <clears throat> Guess who flew me down to uh, to Quinion? Don Ship. Now I got my <laughs> bag. The two of you. <laughs> <laughs> How'd he get off the ground? <laughs> I was just getting ready to tell you. You know, at Play Two, you know, you had that that downhill uh, runway, PSP. Oh, there, there was about a, a three and a half foot barbed wire fence that was down in places down at, yeah. at the approach end. We took off Max. We barely cleared that little fence, oh. and we were. <laughs> You know the, the the topography. It it went clear down, and then dropped off on the coastal plain. Remember? Yep, yep. But Don Ship, we were never. We were... <laughs> yeah. Chip was an offensive tackle for the University of Texas Arlington. He was the biggest guy I ever saw. He got just filled up a room, and <laughs> he, this this clown, was almost as big. And the two of them in a bird dog. Oh God! <laughs> oh man, I can I poor bird dog. That poor poor bird we, dog. We were we were the two biggest men in the company. Yeah, that's right. Big guys, big guys. <laughs> Did not know you were that big, Mister John. Wow, that, that oh, yes, now he, thinking that I would like to see a picture scrunched up a big, in a bird dog. A big guy. You you, you got we went six, you went six one. And you were a couple hundred, I'm sure. Six two. Six, six two. two. Yeah. And 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 uh and Don was the same about the same height. Yep. And, and we, we both were in the two fifty. We were both in the two fifty range for, for weight. Yeah. The ship was he was a he was just gigantic. He was just gigantic. Sturdy boys. Wow. Sturdy, <laughs> sturdy. Um, speaking of hairy flights, Al, this is a good one. I, I can't remember if we've ever asked this. Have y'all did y'all get crazy turbulence ever? I mean, y'all was so so low, I don't know, but ever up high, did y'all get some? Oh, the winds over those over those hill masses in, in two core. Yeah, you get you'd get to funny places. But the that was funny as was did you ever fly out of Chia Rio? No, I didn't. There's a place down there they call the wind tunnel. Oh. And it's a place that looked like it was carved out by a uh, by a, a chunk of ice. And I got in there. I got in there and it flipped me inverted. Oh, God. In the bird dog? In the bird dog, yeah. Oh, how did you... I mean, uh, well, I got it. I, I I don't know how I did it. I really don't. Uh, you know, something automatic took over, and I I got it right. It I got the hell out of that what they what they called the wind tunnel. That's terrifying. My God. Yeah. But it uh, Alex is on a roll here. We've only got one or two more, and I'll let you guys close out the show or whatever y'all would like okay. to talk about, but this is interesting. Um, 
did you or any of your of your peers ever turn down a mission due to the inherent danger associated with said mission? If so, could you relay the details that led you if you did decline the mission? Uh, why it was so dangerous that you declined it? I never did. No. Wow. Never. There were some, did you, did, you know, there were some you thought were stupid, but, but you did them anyway. I mean, it, 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 it was not an option. Whoever was assigning those missions was usually a major. And you're looking at a couple of captains and, and <laughs> you know, you know, go over there. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, y'all. Here, here's, here's the thing. Most most of the I, I'd say 99 percent of the of the missions that we flew, we were either prepping to put our uh, guys on the ground or we were going to get them. So there was no basis. I mean, it, it was everybody. It was a shared danger for everybody. So, uh, you know, <laughs> There's no turning that down. I mean, you don't turn that I, down. Even the even the, the things that Phil and I hated the most, because the mission had changed by the time I was about halfway through my my time there, from you know, working with the teams, they were reducing the amount of teams on the ground. So we were doing a lot of a lot of photo missions, and that's what the four drums thing was about. So. We knew we were going to get our asses shut off, but we 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 did them anyway. And and you know, Phil, we had we had a problem with the S three then. Um, he did not like us, and we hated him. But that was this no after I left. Yeah. Was it yeah. the crew after I left? I think yeah. I think we had the respect of the of of uh, Jacks uh, and Leets and and cert certainly Colonel Ash. Yeah. yeah. But but that when when the next guy showed up, whoever it was, it took over for apt, and um, and then uh, the uh, who the hell I forget who the S three was when I first got there, but the next guy um, who showed up, who was a toad, and it, and it they didn't they could have cared less, they could not have cared less about us, so it's it's just. And we just avoided them like the plague. Yeah. What was that Shungle that showed up that treated y'all so bad? Colonel Shung or Colonel Shungle? No. No? Okay. No. Because he, he he took over in 70 or yeah, in 70. He was at Lang Vey and then ended up uh taking uh I think he took Apps? No, he was the director. I'm sorry of Op 35. He wasn't even the commander at no, CCC. No, I, I take no. that back. Sorry, guys. I had a brain fart there. Sorry, sorry. Different guy. That's a shame. I, I and especially with the dangerous work y'all are doing in there, you've got to contend with someone that has probably not been on the ground or left the the, the FOB since they've got there. You know, giving y'all hard times. I've I've never understood officers doing that to, to, to guys can't can't explain it and and when you realized that you were in a no-win situation here uh -huh. you just you just avoided it like the play you go do what you go do what they ask you to do so that they didn't have a reason to give you to to do any more to you than they were already doing that's why when we talked about the maps remember i told you the story about this S3 cutting my map off at the uh, Mekong that guy. In the waste paper basket. That guy. That guy. Oh, you guys, yeah. you guys had it really bad then uh, after I left because I, I used to get upset with Don Dahl. You remember him? His his was no neck. Yeah. You remember that calls out? Yeah, he was the assistant three, and his favorite comment was, you know, when when we'd have a team in trouble. Oh, tell them break contact and continue mission. <laughs> and these guys, these guys are running. You can hear them; they're out of breath. Hear the dogs barking that are chasing them, and and break contact, continue mission. <laughs> right. Well, McGowan said, or rather, Terry Cadback said that that the guy that followed App was a guy named McGowan. And uh, <laughs> who, yeah, who wrote that book? 
a CCC recon man while y'all were in 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 uh, working at CCC, Raymond Harris from RT Iowa. Now is that uh, is that still being published? It is. You can pick it up. It's still available. I recommend it thoroughly. It is a wonderful, wonderful book with a lot of good write ups by Plaster and uh, Dave Meyer and all kinds of guys. Okay. Uh, Ray Harris, break contact and continue mission. The most <laughs> dreaded words a recon man or hatchet force man could hear. But now, yes, we, Mr. Terry. Know, we're, 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 we're out there and, and we know the, the, the stress those guys are under. And, 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 and for us to be told to tell them to do that when, you know, they, they have, it, we're, we're almost crying that they got to get out of there because they're, they're in peril. So, yeah. But, so, you know, you were mentioning a while ago about the guys being out there at night. They had Leghorn that they could talk to. Not very well. Yeah, well, so not always either. Yeah. We, we had a relay through. You ever do a touch and go off the helipad? Like, no, that, uh... <laughs> <laughs> is, there is there a story there y'all would like to share on uh, touching and going like <laughs> Just this is what I meant by God must have liked him. <laughs> okay. I was about to say, with touching and going leghorn, that sounds like yeah, you need God's grace. <laughs> <laughs> Terry saying uh they they'd get moonbeam at night in Hillsborough during the day uh hopefully if they they were lucky with the 130s up in the air to get communication yeah, with y'all. Was he was always there. But that's still terrifying like you said jumping off and literally you hear the 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 choppers leave and it's nothing but you the Indig and that other American or the other American with them. And I, I can't imagine. And then y'all up there alone with a, either a SOG backseater or just y'all. I mean, y'all, like they say, uh, ever since we started having y'all on, y'all must have had to leave the air, the, the, the landing strip with a wheelbarrow to carry your balls back to the basin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we flew a lot of solo missions. There wasn't yeah. always a high ship, and there wasn't always somebody in your back seat. No. That, I mean, so that I mean, it, it was a common enough thing to where y'all got used to being alone on, yep. on a fairly. Mm, mm. Well, I mean, did y'all did y'all prefer being alone, or would you always like to have a, a SOG backseater with with you, or did you work better alone sometimes, or? I. You just. I, whatever. It, whatever. Whatever the conditions were on the day we we cranked up, did a pre-flight. Yeah. Did uh, one question to close before we let y'all uh, say anything y'all want to. Let me find it because Al Alex or maybe, yeah, Baz had it. Um, speaking of having a SOG backseater, what what was – we may have covered in the last one, but did y'all guys have a plan with the backseater or when you were alone, what the heck you were going to do? God forbid if y'all went down and the enemy got close or just even if y'all went down. If I were going to – if I was going down, I was always looking for bamboo and because that's where I was going to put the airplane. And if I was with a, a, a backseater like, like Bucky or uh, – or uh, one of the uh, one zeros that we were doing a, a, a recon with. The deal there was that I was I was not going first. I was following them, and whatever That's they right. told me to do, I was going to do. And yep. and if I went down by myself, I didn't know. I so the only the only plan I had was that if I I always carried a couple of rounds in my shirt pocket and they were for me if I was by myself because I figured that if I got shot down I was going to get tortured mm -hmm. and then they were going to kill me so I figured that and I didn't want to be tortured 
So I was just going to just make it make it easy for everybody. And did I want to do that? No, I'm a Catholic. You don't do that kind of thing. But I would have, you know, just I just would have. I did. Not that was going out. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That was my idea. Mm. With me, I guess I was a little bit of a. Um, I, I guess maybe I just thought I was indestructible. <laughs> the eternal optimist. Yeah, I just that was it. Anybody, uh, anybody, anybody who drank Crown, Crown Royal and milk had to be indestructible. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So listen to this, Thank uh, you very much. Yeah, absolutely. I and again, uh, anytime I was speaking with Jason Holmes offline about you be worried about there being too much of an influx of, of SPAF guests here recently, and everyone's concurred, there cannot be too many SPAF shows or SPAF interviews. So uh, y'all always have a home here. Uh, you're always welcome anytime. And absolutely, we, we've got to get you hooked up with another person on the ground from CCC, Mr. Terry. If both y'all would like to join with Mr. Terry, I'd love to set that up for next great. month if possible. You should do that, John, with me. I'd love it. Okay. Well, good. Uh, Mr. Terry, if you're watching, this. we're going to set that up for next month then. That's perfect. Okay. Um, That's great. I will, uh, I'll stay in touch with you guys. Well, first off, is there anything you would like to say before we shut her down for today? Just thank you. Thank you for yeah, letting I us tell our, tell our story. I mean, there weren't many of us. You know, maybe maybe fifteen, sixteen of us that flew this mission, but we're we're here, and uh, and it's it, it. Nobody would know about us if you didn't do this. Well, it, it's my pleasure and it's my honor. I I can't. I'm just. I'm extremely lucky, as I've been telling all of you. I'm I'm I'm, I'm just thankful that I'm able able to talk to y'all. And now that I've got my computer up to date and able to do this. I'm eternally grateful that y'all trust me enough to come on here and share y'all's story and answer questions from viewers that are just as interested as I am that aren't able to speak to y'all. So I, I, I have to thank y'all as much as y'all thank me today. Um, and again, guys, before we close, Mr. Frank has his book out, his bio, and both the men we're speaking with today are in this book. And a lot of stories not spoken about today are in this book. So uh, they will be in the, it'll be in the show notes as well as Mr. Frank's prior visits with us. Um, so I believe we will, uh, shut her down for today. And I, again, thank you uh, for joining us and I'll be in touch and we'll get, uh, another show set up for y'all up in the air and Mr. Terry on the ground. Appreciate thank your, you. uh, appreciate your interest in us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, thank you. I hope y'all have a wonderful Friday. You do you the too. same. Thanks, yes, Frank. Take care, John.